the Honorable Member for Brant. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I stand today and am pleased to support Bill C-44, the Helping Families in Need Act. Before I make my formal remarks, I would like to just uh, extend to both the uh, NDP and Liberal parties my appreciation for your support of this bill. Even though at this point it just sounds there may be some conditions around that, I think this is a great example of what, of what is considered to be by some parents and, and groups across the nation revolutionary change and certainly a compassionate new way to recognize those who are most in need. The bill contains three measures that will help Canadian families at the time when they are most in need. These measures are EI benefits for parents of critically ill children, enhanced access to sickness benefits for parents receiving EI parental benefits, and federal income support for parents of murdered or missing children. Thankfully, we have a Prime Minister in government who understands that families are the building blocks of our society and recognizes that parents should have the option to be with their children at a time of crisis without fear of losing their job or financial security. I would also highlight the work of the member from Leeds-Grenville and his private member's bill on this matter in the last two parliaments, and acting as a catalyst that provided for these changes in this very compassionate bill, as well as, the, as, well as recognizing the member for Selkirk Interlake, who moved a motion in 2006 on this topic and, has, and had been de a determined advocate for parents of critically ill children. You know, today presents a very rare opportunity for a member of parliament, for myself as a member of parliament, to be able to connect with an issue so personal and so close and to tell a story I've never told in public. I stand today to speak for the many families whose lives will be suddenly turned upside down and irreversibly changed as they are told that their child has a life-threatening critical illness or is told that their child has been murdered or is missing and cannot be found. The Canadian Cancer Society reports that today and every day in Canada, four families will receive the news that their child has a life-threatening cancer diagnosis. That's four today, four tomorrow, and four every day. 24 years ago, my family, I received the news that our two-year-old son was critically ill with a very high risk, life-threatening leukemia, and the odds of his survival would be slim. The news was delivered on a Saturday afternoon, and we had an immediate transfer from our local hospital to the McMaster Oncology Unit in Hamilton, where toxic chemicals were injected into his body to arrest the blood cells gone wild. Remission happened two weeks later, and an aggressive two-year chemotherapy and radiation protocol was put into place after the McMaster team of doctors determined that would, that's what would be necessary to cure our son. We spent over 270 days in hospital over those two years, our son went through cranial radiation, spinal cord injections regularly, toxic chemicals put into his body, but always there was one parent by his side. We quickly realized that we were not unique. There were eight to 12 other families at the McMaster Oncology Unit at any point in time at different points in the process. You see, it is true, cancer does not discriminate. It does not discriminate social situations, economic situations, or for that matter, any situation that people find themselves in. Now, I was self-employed, and I never had, frankly, the opportunity to participate in EI. 
It was never available up to all the time that our government changed it for self-employed people to be part of an EI program. And now our government has set the platform for self-employed people to be able to be uh, part of the EI program. So even then, back in the uh, 24 years ago, um, that wasn't even possible. Our, correct, our government corrected that. We also learned at that time, with life-threatening conditions, that, it's, that much more is needed than just round-the-clock medical care to get better. Your children need the comfort of their parents and their family beside them. Our son Jordan is a miracle child. Now 26, he is here with us today in Ottawa, a cancer survivor, having beat the odds. A very unique young man, because like many who received the same treatment protocol, he suffered brain damage from his treatment protocol, the combination of cranial radiation and a very aggressive chemotherapy. There are many families who face such circumstances, and no parent should have to choose between job, between a job and supporting a loved one. I can tell many stories of the families we met at the McMaster Oncology Unit, but I'll tell one that has stuck with our family ever since we spent the two years on that unit. And it's the story of a 16-year-old girl. And she was in the room right next to our sons. And every time we went back, because there would be times we would be able to go home and then back, as I said, we spent over 270 days in hospital, she would be on the ward, experiencing yet another trial of bone marrow transplant or some other experimental drug to try to save her from this dreaded disease. And the one time that we were there, her family would, had totally gathered because all of the, of the treatment options had been exhausted. A beautiful young girl, age 16, with her family around her, saying goodbye to her because the end was near. This was not an unusual story with children at many ages who are being treated today at many hospitals across this country. As we have said here today, this will help immediately 6,000 families. It will also help everyone as this goes forward. And so when we are told by the opposition that this is something that is conditional, this should not be conditional. This should have happened a long time ago under previous governments for all the people who are currently experiencing it. And when Sharon Ruth speaks, and she spoke at the announcement last week about her daughter, her situation absolutely parallels ours and many other families. And she has been such a strong advocate through these years, through the member for Leeds Grenville, to bring it to where it is today. And so a criticism from the opposition to say that this is conditional is absolutely unacceptable in my mind. Mr. Speaker, as mentioned also, the Helping Families in Need Act also provides federal income support of parents of murdered or missing children. I would be remiss if I did not highlight the work of my caucus colleague, Senator Boabanu, for his tireless advocacy on behalf, behalf of victims of crime. It was his personal experience with the tragic loss of his daughter, who was murdered. He took up this matter, and his advocacy work has led to this part of this proposal. For far too long, families who are touched by a traumatic cir uh, circumstance of, criminal, of a criminal act committed against a family member have not received the support they not only need, but they deserve. As Senator Boisvenu will tell you himself, the unique situations family, families face when seeking justice within the criminal justice system require a unique measure to support them during this trying time. These measures expand on and complement other government supports for parents, many of which have been strengthened <coughs> through our economic action plan. 
Our government recognizes that it is difficult for working Canadians to balance their job and their desire to care for family members with a serious illness or disability, or cope with the trauma of a missing or murdered child. I personally cannot imagine what that news would be like receiving. I am hopeful that the opposition will be supporting this legislation as they said they will, because this legislation needs to be passed quickly to meet our, our, our government's ambitious timelines for implementation. I cannot put it better than Sharon Ruth, the mother of the cancer survivor, as she spoke last week when we announced this new act, when she said the following, my hope is that this legislation passes quickly without incident. I know all too well what it's like to suffer an emotional and financial devastation of a child with a cancer diagnosis. The sooner the government can bring relief to those thousands of families across Canada currently navigating this life-altering journey, juggling their jobs, trying to pay their bills, spending the majority of their time at the hospital, assisting with the treatments, and the hope is the better. Mr. Speaker, it's pretty hard to argue with that. So I call on all members of this House to support, to support this with speedy passage, Bill C-44, so we can deliver this much-needed help to families in incredibly difficult circumstances. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Questions and comments? The Honourable Member for York South Weston. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and uh, I want to thank my colleague for his comments and, and the quite touching uh, stories and, and family histories that he gave us. However, and while we do support the notion of this bill, I think uh, some on the other side might agree that this is only the beginning of the changes that are necessary to, uh, to the EI to make it easier for families in this country. That, uh, for example, uh, women are discriminated against because if they are in receipt of maternity benefits, um, they cannot qualify for regular EI if they are laid off after the return from maternity benefits. Um, the, uh, the Liberals brought in a measure which uh, lowered the rate payable to, from 60% to 55% that was supposed to be temporary because of a temporary blip in the economy, but it's been there ever since and nobody's ever, none of the other, none of the governments have ever done anything to put it back. So would the member like to uh, uh, comment on these two issues about whether these things need to be fixed in the EI system as well. The Honourable Member for Brent. I thank the uh, Honourable Member for his question and uh, really today's discussion is about a totally different subject matter that he's bringing up. However, if you look at the track record, if you look at what our government has done since we've taken office to help improve employment insurance for those who are in true need, you will see about six steps to set the platform to where we are today. And I alluded to one in my speech, which is the fact that self-employed people, and these are typically small business owners like myself, as I was. I had a workforce of about 15 to 20 individuals, a small company. Yet I couldn't be part of an EI program. Our government corrected that. Our government has gone on to provide more benefits, greater benefits in the things we have done to employment insurance since we've been elected than any of the previous governments here, here. that I've been part of and watched through my lifetime. Questions and comments? The Honourable Member for Renfrew, Nipissing Pembroke. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I would like to thank our colleague for sharing his very personal and moving story and how it applies to the legislation before us. Would the member please describe the program itself, the new benefit, how long it lasts, who qualifies, and how it's different from the compassionate care benefit? The Honourable Member for Brent. Well, I thank my, uh, my colleague for her fine question here. And how the program works is that it's, it's proposed currently, if the legislation passes, to be a 35-week additional benefit for income support 
for parents over and above their regular EI benefits to get them through that critical period of time as they're facing the, the, uh, the, the amazing uh, journey that they'll be on and having to stay with their child to get through their life-threatening illness. And so that's the most key element, is the fact that it, it will add to the current, uh, current EI protocol by 35 weeks. Questions and comments? Can I comment that? The Honourable Member for Malpec. Thank you, uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I, uh, I too would uh, uh, congratulate the uh, the member for Brant on uh, on outlining what uh, has to be a very uh, very difficult uh, personal story. Uh, but, uh, Mr. Speaker, my problem with the legislation and some of the uh, comments here here today uh, is the experience that we've had with this particular Minister of Human Resources Development. We had a debate within this House yesterday. The Minister did, I will admit, in question period today, come back with different examples than she's been using all along. Uh, but the Minister said everyone would benefit, and we know that is now not the truth. Uh, and so we haven't had a briefing on this particular legislation yet. It doesn't come until tonight. I know what the Act says is wonderful in, glow in glowing terms. In fact, I agree with what it says in the summary of this particular bill. A lot of us have been advocating for a long time that the sick leave under the current EI legislation is not adequate enough. MS, cancer, uh, many, many other cases. Uh, but, uh, but my question really to the member from Brant is, uh, how can he give us some assurance that at the end of the day we're not going to get caught short by this minister again, who obviously doesn't know her files, who put previous, uh, previous changes into the Act and were found to be wrong? And we have people suffering in my region as a result of that. So can you give us any assurance that what the minister claims will be... The Honourable Member for Brent. Well, I thank the, the, the member for the sentiment of the question, but it, it, it is quite a uh, characterization that he's given to a minister who's actually stepped up to the plate and held a, a, a commitment, an election commitment, let me read to you what Dan Demers said, who is the uh, Canadian Cancer Society at the press conference, who represents Canadian Cancer Society. It's, criti it's critically important that we acknowledge that in the last election, this government made a commitment to parents and families who are caring for children in the most difficult situations we can imagine today. We're not only, we're not only seeing the government take action to fulfill its commitment, but they're moving in this town at lightning speed. That was said by the, by the representative from the Canadian Can Cancer Society. So having said that, it's in total conflict and actually to what, what this member has just described in terms of a minister realizing there's a need there, creating the legislation to be able to take care of that need and putting it together, being advised by people like myself and others like Sharon Ruth who are in the situation. So I can assure the member this, well, we've got it right. We're, this is the right step to take, and it's because of the commitment of this minister. Merci beaucoup, Monsieur le Président. Et la question que je me pose, c'est il y a eu des projets de loi similaires, même par ses, des collègues du député conservateur. Il y a plusieurs projets de loi dans d'autres parlements qui ont été présentés à ce sujet. Il y en a d'autres à d'autres sujets, d'autres réformes importantes qu'il faudrait apporter euh, à l'assurance-emploi, notamment comme je dans la question que je l'ai posée plus tôt à un autre collègue, euh, le dossier comme le fameux dossier de Marie-Hélène Dubé qui parle justement de prolonger la période des, euh, de l'assurance-emploi pour, pour des gens qui sont gravement malades. Donc, malgré qu'on appuie ces mesures, on a aussi l'impression que ça l'a tardé et on sent un peu l'improvisation comme si la ministre veut faire oublier les déboires dans le dossier de l'assurance-emploi jusqu'à maintenant. Donc, est-ce qu'il peut expliquer, un, pourquoi ça a pris autant de temps pour le gouvernement d'implémenter ces mesures, et deux, euh, pour, quand est-ce qu'ils vont faire plus pour amener d'autres avantages pour les gens qui doivent se servir de nos systèmes d'assurance-emploi? The Honourable Member for Brent. 
Well, I thank the member for his, uh, his uh, comments as well in question, but again, they're somewhat misdirected because in actual fact, what we're witnessing with this Act, a government bill, it was introduced in private members' motions and bills in previous governments. He's absolutely correct with that. But the government has recognized, and our government, our Conservative government, has said we need to take the first steps in making sure we provide the supports that families who are true in true need have to have in this country. So they don't have to worry about the economics of their situation. Now, I have seen in the last parliament that, that was, those motions were opposed in the, in, the, in the previous parliaments. They were opposed. The opposition was, was stalling and, not, and trying to not allow us to bring this kind of legislation forward. So that's the history of this. We're taking action. We have time for a, a short question and response. The Honourable Member for Kitchener, Conestoga. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. <clears throat> I too want to congratulate my colleague from Brant, uh, not only on the great speech today, but also on the amazing uh, care and compassion that I've witnessed this family give to Jordan over the years. I had the privilege of meeting Jordan yesterday in the lobby, and uh, just a great, uh, great example of care and compassion. Uh, my, my colleague outlined a number of the changes that have occurred in, in terms of the change for self-employed individuals. Our e EI system now recognizes that. Also, the number of weeks that are provided. But there's one key element that's different here that we heard in the Parliamentary Committee on Compassionate Care as well that was being called for, and that was to change the definition <laughs> of when you could take this EI benefit from being the parent of a terminally ill child to being the parent of a gravely or critically ill child. Now, I wonder if my colleague could just comment on how important that is to, to parents and how important it would have been had that been in, in place when they faced their very difficult situation. Thank you. The Honourable Member for Brant, a short response, please. Well, I thank my colleague for his comments and question as well. And where, what is most critical is the continuity of being with your child throughout this. And you can imagine, this is a child as young as less than a year old to you know 18 years old in that range and you need as a as a family and as a parent the ability to focus on the continuity of the care of that child and making sure you do everything possible to create the circumstances for them to be well and i believe that's what the member was asking our bill accommodates that 